Welcome everybody to the first edition of Manless TV. Uh, the interest in this program has been overwhelming and I want to thank our nearly 700 subscribers who signed up before we even posted a single thing. Wow, uh, that is amazing. I'm definitely feeling the love. You said you wanted more of the man list. You said you wanted me raw and unfiltered. Well, I don't know how raw I can get in one of my suits, but I'm going to be a lot less filtered from now on. Uh, this is our show, and by ours, I mean yours and mine. I'm going to answer questions from the fans on a weekly basis, and I'm going to do the segments that everyone wants to see. Get ready for enhanced Sunday roast and toast. Get ready for some instructional segments as well. As we grow, get ready for interviews with players, coaches, and front office personnel from around Major League Baseball. Anticipate similar, if not better, content than what you're used to getting from me, only it'll be way less muzzled. So here's what's happening in the world of Major League Baseball as of 12 noon Pacific Standard Time on February 28th, 2018. Yesterday, the Blue Jays shut down Marcus Stroman indefinitely when a precautionary MRI revealed inflammation in his throwing shoulder. There was no structural damage, and the film itself was described by Stroman as being super clean. Well, that's good news, because a little bit of inflammation happens to just about everybody that plays this game. And uh, having seen the way he came back from ACL replacement surgery, I don't imagine that it'll be too long before Stroman's back out there pitching for your Toronto Blue Jays, and uh, it'll be sooner than later, I bet you. Uh, he doesn't anticipate being ready for opening day, but he's not ruling it out. He is a quick healer, after all. In other news, Chris Bryant of the Cubs says the players are ready to fight for big changes in the next collective bargaining agreement. To that, I say, good luck, boys. Uh, the owners finally gained ground towards a hard cap, and what did the Players Association get in return? According to anonymous sources from MLB front offices, the union fought harder for days off than continued ability to earn money. If you ask me, ownership's just gotten smart and leveraged a generation's preference for comfort over battle. They Trojan horsed a form of salary cap into the collective bargaining agreement disguised as a luxury tax. That's exactly what my generation and the ones before us fought so hard against. Now, I hope these players don't think the owners are just going to roll over and give it all back. Just sounds like sour grapes to me. We're all very aware that the free agents haven't received the offers that they were expecting. But as I've said, it's time for them to start taking some responsibility for the market itself. You guys made this monster. Now live with it. Uh, things have changed. The analytics have really, really altered the way teams see long-term contracts. Uh, they're way less interested in paying top dollar for a diminishing asset on the back end of that deal. Uh, teams used to offer up years five and beyond for the chance at a difference-making talent in years one through four. Uh, but it doesn't seem like they're willing to do that anymore. Typically, guys hit free agency in their early 30s. Rare talents like Manny Machado and Bryce Harper are going to hit free agency in their mid-20s, and therefore deserve the 7-10 to 10 year contracts that they're likely going to get. Beyond those situations, I'd be shocked to see deals of those kind of terms ever again. Second tier free agents are finding it hard to find 5 year deals out there right now. And it's because of their age, and teams know that there's a really small chance, if any at all, that they're going to get top level production at the back end of those contracts from guys in their late 30s. It's just not happening. Now, some guys talk a good game, and it's pretty easy to talk that game when you're still a few years away from even beginning negotiations. I'll be shocked when they actually sit down uh, to start negotiating if ownership is even willing to yield at all. Why would they? They finally broke down the union in a meaningful way. Besides, all they really need to do is dangle some creature comforts in front of these guys, and they'll likely be too distracted to put up much of a fight. In an effort to show some strength, though, the MLBPA... Uh, they filed a grievance against the Rays, Athletics, Pirates, and Marlins for how they're spending their revenue-sharing money. That's just embarrassing. These, these guys, you know, they gave away their earning potential. Now they want to about how the teams exploit the rules. You gave them the ceiling, so stop complaining about how many times and how often you're bumping your head up against it. I seriously doubt the owners are actually going to renegotiate that ceiling, but maybe you guys can negotiate a, a, a floor, a basement. 
some place to start from. So every team has to spend at least a certain amount of money on major league talent every year. I say, what a shame. The union that I once knew is a pale imitation, or I should say this union is a pale imitation of what it once was. The strongest collective in the world. Um, I just don't feel sorry for them. Uh, I hope they enjoy the personal vegan clubhouse chefs and all the creature comforts. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, th this next generation of player is going to appreciate the way you gave away the, the, the rights that were fought so hard to give to you. I don't know about it, but I, I can sure smell a roast coming on for sure. On a lighter note, Japanese sensation Shohei Otani made his pitching debut going one and a third innings. He allowed two hits, two runs, one walk, a very loud home run, and one wild pitch. He threw 26 pitches in the first inning. 12 of them were balls, so you could say command's a bit of an issue right now. Now, he may have been nervous. It was his debut, after all. But uh, Angels fans should all, all understand that Otani is what you would call a project on the mound. Um, he's a way more polished bat at this point in his career, and uh, you know it's going to be a matter of time. Uh, he's got a great arm. He's got great stuff. Uh, but the game's played differently over there. Uh, sometimes it takes guys from the Japanese leagues a little bit more time to assimilate to the major league game, especially on the mound. Uh, in Japan, they throw a ton more off-speed pitches. Uh, starting pitchers typically throw one game in every seven days. In the big leagues, they go every fifth day, and you're facing the best hitters in the world. That's a lot more stress on an arm. Fellow countrymen Daisuke Matsuzaka and Yu Darvish, they came to the show with uh, a lot of fanfare. Both of them started off pretty fast, but they had their troubles later on. Dice K seemed to run through his pitch count in five innings because he threw so many different pitches, he, he just couldn't keep up. He was the master of none, and he ended up blowing out his elbow. And, uh, you know, that's never good. Otani hit Japanese pitching pretty well during his career there, and uh, I'd have to say, as of today, he is a much more polished hitter than he is a pitcher. He DH'd on Monday, walking twice and singling in a run. Showed some base running instincts when he advanced on a short wild pitch. But it looks like the Angels see his future on the mound, and I have to agree with him. If he remains a hitter, I'm going to predict a, a fairly modest career. Um, if I were him, I'd figure out fastball command and stick to pitching. You know, Major League dropouts go over there and hit 40 homers a year. They don't career average 280 and, and have minimal pop in a band box AAA caliber league. He throws in the mid and the upper 90s. Uh, has some interesting off-speed stuff, and uh, I'd focus on that by all accounts. Um, I think the Angels are going to stay focused on him as a pitcher, and uh, I know I agree with that. I think that's where his future lies. I think that's where the big upside is going to be. Leave it to Joe Madden to offer up a different perspective on the league's new mandate that each team be limited to six non-pitching change visits per nine innings. Uh, Having played for him, I can tell you without any hesitation, Joe sees things a little bit differently than most. Uh, he's worried more about being able to communicate a game plan in the moment than he is about changing signs. You know, my questions to Major League Baseball are as follows, though. How many times do you need to change the game plan in the first six innings while the inning is going on? And then in the last three innings, how many times do you actually need to go out there and change the strategy? I don't understand it. Um, the game usually grinds to a screeching halt in innings seven through nine because it seems like managers are changing pitchers every time a new hitter strolls to the plate. Why not just trade the strategy then? Talk about your, your, your sign changes when you're out there. John Lester, he added to the conversation when he recently sounded off about the technology that seems to be at play in the game. He claims that every ballpark has a dedicated camera that points directly at the catcher's crotch for the sole purpose of stealing signs. To that, I say good. They should take advantage of technology. No amount of mound visits are going to change the fact that your pitchers are all using simplistic sets of signs because they don't want to think that hard when they're out there. Uh, in my experience, pitchers want to get the ball, get into a rhythm, and go. Uh, my opinion has always been if you're too stupid or too lazy to use a complex set of signs, then you get what you deserve. I say, let them use earpieces. Let them use walkie-talkies. I hope it'll speed things up. I think nobody's going to care. Six mound visits is plenty, if not overkill. Now, complex sets of signs should be taught in the minor leagues so that pitchers are used to them by the time they get to the show. Uh, take off the training wheels for the love of Pete and actually teach these kids 
something before they get to the big leagues that doesn't involve hitting it 500 feet, throwing it through a wall, or managing their social media accounts. Doing your homework before each game is every player's responsibility to himself and to his team. Be prepared and prepare properly. Now, my final thought on this one is, if you need six mound visits every nine innings to remind your players where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing at the big league level, maybe you're not doing your job properly. They should already know what to do and where to be. Remember, it's not illegal for you to actually talk to your players when they're in the dugout while your team is hitting. So go over there. Talk about strategy. Change the signs. Do it then. Take advantage of the fact that you have a private atmosphere in which to discuss these things. There are defining moments in every manager's tenure. The new manager of the New York Mets may have already had his. Dominic Smith showed up late for work and he was scratched from the lineup by Callaway for disciplinary reasons. You ask me here in the respects of guys like Todd Fraser who applauded the move by the rookie manager and I applaud him too. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of discipline. It goes a long way. The season hasn't even started and Mickey Callaway has already proven he has a backbone and he's in charge. That's a rare thing in today's game where the inmates seem to be running the asylum. It's not surprising that Callaway's most recent job was working with Terry Francona. Terry Francona, he's one of the game's best managers, and it shouldn't come as any surprise to anyone that he's also one of the game's best communicators. I played for him in the Arizona Fall League, and he was dealing with egos like Michael Jordan back then. And last summer I sat down with him, and I watched the way his players responded to him. At one point, he was simultaneously carrying on a cribbage game with Josh Tomlin as he questioned Francisco Lindor about a base running gaffe he had committed the night before. You could tell there was an enormous amount of respect on both sides of the desk. Player for the manager, manager for the player. And I, I tell you what, it came as no surprise uh, when early this spring, Francona's communication skills were lauded uh, by the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, they, they chronicled the, the, the notion or the, the uh, occurrence of Francona basically talking to uh, Kipnis and Ramirez. He told Jason Kipnis, you go worry about playing second base, and Jose, you go worry about playing third. If there are any surprises, we'll deal with them when they come up, and we'll deal with them together. Now, he was speaking of the possibility that Michael Brantley's surgically repaired ankle won't be ready for opening day because, as you remember, Kipnis was tinkering with playing the outfield last year. This is real simple stuff, gang. Let the players know exactly where they stand and what your expectations are, and you will likely see them live up to those expectations. A lot of managers get caught up in all the other stuff that's going on around them because they're not smart enough to deal with the game. It moves too fast for them. They lack the intelligence to juggle multiple tasks at a time. And that one of those multiple tasks is just simply communicating with their own players. They want to know where they stand, even if they don't like it. They want to know what the expectations are being placed on them. All it takes is a simple conversation. It shouldn't be that hard. In fact, communication should be one of the, the main skills of every major league manager. J.D. Martinez has been medically cleared to play, so it's pretty much over but the crying. He is now a member of the Boston Red Sox. Dave Dombrowski has landed the top free agent hitter uh, in this market, and he added him to an already talented American League East lineup that lacked a bit of home run power in 2017. Now, their rotation's awfully thin right now if Eduardo Rodriguez and Stephen Wright, in fact, cannot answer the bell for opening day. And the rumor out of Red Sox camp is neither one will be ready. They're going to need all the offense they can get. The Red Sox have some really, really talented young guys in that lineup to go with veterans like Dustin Pedroia and Hanley Ramirez, uh, youngsters like Mookie Betts, Andrew Benintendi, Andrew Bogarts, and Jackie Bradley Jr. I mean, those kids can hit. Now, they lack the punch of other uh, American League East rivals like the Yankees, but Martinez is going to help close that gap. He actually had 21 more home runs than any other Red Sox player last year. Uh, you need power in the American League East if you want to keep up, and now the Red Sox have a legitimate right-handed power bat to take aim at that short porch called the Green Monster. Now, they couple that power with those youngsters uh, who seem to get a little better each year, and the Red Sox are going to give the odds-on favorite New York Yankees a run for their money. And oh, by the way, 
we shouldn't forget that the Red Sox, they won over 90 games last year and the division. So as tempting as it is to anoint them the American League East champions, uh, we need to be respectful of that Boston team. They were good last year, and they just got a whole lot better. Who's looking for free agent pitching? I know I am, especially all-star caliber pitching. Everyone should be. Uh, looks like the Nationals and the Brewers are the most serious out there. Throw in the New York Yankees, and you probably have the most likely landing spots for free agents like Jake Arrieta, Lance Lynn, Alex Cobb. Uh, now, recently, Yankees manager Aaron Boone admitted that the Bronx Bombers were probably out on Lance Lynn and Cobb, but I wouldn't rule them out on Jake Arrieta, however. Arrieta to the Brewers? That'd be quite a coup for uh, Milwaukee, but... Uh, you know, I don't see it happening. I mean, I know they lost out to Darvis to the uh, division rival Cubs, but I just can't see Jake Arrieta in a Brewers uniform long term. Call me crazy. It just doesn't seem like it's going to be a fit. Now, Baltimore, Texas, and Philly are also sniffing around, but uh, aren't reported to be as serious as uh, the Washington Nationals, Milwaukee Brewers, and the Yankees. I was going to say they're probably just dipping the proverbial toe into the water at this point. Uh, I think Lance Lynn would be a nice fit in Baltimore or Texas, but I don't get Philly's interest right now given the huge gap between them and the Washington Nationals. We're talking 31 games in 2017. Uh, why would you want to spend that money now? The kind of money it would take to sign any of those free agents would, would be uh, much more well spent uh, when the Phillies get a little bit better. I don't think they're close to contending in the, in the National League East. And they probably won't be for a couple of more years. It it's, seems a little premature to me for Philly to be looking around at these top free agent guys. My guess, Arietta's going to go to New York or Washington. If either team lands Arietta, everyone else in their respective division will probably be playing for second place if they're not already. Bob Nightingale says the Nats are very engaged with Arietta, and Mike Rosenstein of New Jersey Advanced Media corroborates that the Nationals desire to add a top pitcher uh, to their rotation uh, is, is imminent. And uh, they already have a former Cy Young Award winner in that rotation in Max Scherzer. Nick Cafardo of the Boston Globe is reporting that the Yankees are again rumored to be in pursuit of Tampa Bay Rays pitcher Chris Archer. And the deal would send prospects to Tampa in exchange. Now, rumors are rumors until they become reality, but Ken Davidoff of the New York Times added some validity to it with the suggestion of the top prospects going south. So there's lots of people talking about this. The Twins just got a little better. Logan Morrison has been signed by the Minnesota Twins. Uh, he's a nice addition to that ball club who is going to look to improve on an 85-win uh, season that saw them land a wild card spot. That's a nice left-handed power bat, and he'll likely serve as the DH for uh, the Minnesota Twins. They've also added Jake Odorizzi, Fernando Rodney, Addison Reed, and Anibal Sanchez. And they got a lot better uh, with these additions. Um, they might be playing for second in the Central, but they could definitely throw a monkey wrench into the wild card situation come October if they play as well as they did last year. Now on a sad note, I'm going to say this. I don't own the Tampa Bay Rays, but I believe this club should be ashamed of themselves for this tank job that they are orchestrating. It is so hypocritical for Major League Baseball to mandate that every team have at least four or five regular Major League players in every spring training game, yet they have absolutely no mandate for how good a ball club should be going into the regular season. It almost seems willing to stand by and allow the Tampa Bay Rays to completely gut this franchise and basically make it a triple-A uh, ball club. The Tampa Bay Rays have traded away so many of their top players, I, I can't see a world where they're going to actually be competitive, especially in the American League East. Chris Archer is the last remaining established star pitcher in that rotation. Kevin Kiermeyer, catcher Wilson Ramos, uh, and former Jay and Danny Echevarria are the lone legitimate position players left on the roster. But none of these guys is going to carry this lineup the way a guy like Evan Longoria, who they traded to San Francisco, could. This is really, truly sad for me to see them gut the club this way. Just a couple years ago, they were a perennial playoff contender and a serious fly in the American League East ointment. 
Uh, now, they're a developmental way station for legitimate Major League teams. I, I just don't see how Major League Baseball can sit by and allow this to happen. There are rules regarding showing up every day and doing your best for players. Maybe ownership should be subject to those same rules because it doesn't look like the ownership in the front office of the Tampa Bay Rays are doing their best to put a quality competitive team on the field. According to Mark Topkin of the Tampa Bay Times, Jose Bautista is interested in playing for the Rays. Well, he should be. He has no job and spring training games are already happening. In my opinion, Jose Bautista, he still has a lot to offer a team and I still think he's best suited as a National League role player. He can serve in a number of ways. He can play first, third, right, left, all on a part-time basis for a playoff contender. He'd get a lot of playing time spelling the regulars, platooning, and coming off the bench in double switches. Um, and opportunities seem to be real scarce at this point, but I still say he'll land on his feet if he's willing to play at a discounted rate. He needs to get out there and play, and he needs to get out there and play soon. Now, there's a couple of scenarios that could happen. He ends up with a team like Tampa. He goes out there. He has a monster first half. They trade him to a playoff contender. Jose gets a chance at a ring. Tim Lincecum has signed with the Texas Rangers. They want him to compete for the closer job? What the actual H-E double hockey sticks is going on around here? The freak has been ineffective since his fastball mysteriously lost multiple miles per hour after the 2012 season. Why in the world would you ask a guy to do something he's not good at and hasn't done a whole lot of in his career? The only reason he ever relieved is because they basically felt guilty and they kept him on the playoff roster, and I'm talking about the San Francisco Giants, and then they ran out of pitching, so they had no choice but to throw Tim Lincecum out there in relief. I say do the right thing and give him a shot. Give him a shot at starting and then fall back on using him in the bullpen. This is a guy who's won a Cy Young Award, and I think his career accomplishments have earned him a shot at uh, the comeback, so to speak. Now let's move on to the questions portion of our program. Tommy Stewart wants to know how many wins it will take to win the wild card this year and where were the D-backs right in swapping Sousa Jr. for Drury? Well, quickly, it usually takes about 85 to 90 wins to make it, and especially in that wild card position, and I think it will again this year. And now my thought is always, hey, swap what is for what could be. Because if you really want to get technical, Every single professional baseball player signed to a contract could be, but very few are. So that being said, Steven Souza Jr., he had a breakout season last year, and that had to have bred some confidence in him. I say, bravo, D-backs. I'm a fan of this decision, and uh, I really think it's a nice move. The next question comes from Twitter. Eddie Jones wants to know, is Marcus Stroman too self-involved to be a true number one starter and be the teammate a number one brings to the clubhouse. Well, Eddie, I gotta tell you, all athletes are self-involved. You have to be in order to survive and flourish in any sport. Uh, most, however, have learned to compartmentalize things so they actually have a life outside the sport that they play. That being said, team sport athletes have an uncanny ability to see through their teammates' motivations and priorities. They spend an awful lot of time together, typically more than they actually spend with their friends and family. Uh, the desire to win, it breeds a willingness to kind of look the other way and put up with a lot of BS from really good players. As long as they keep playing well, people put up with it. And that's going to continue to happen no matter. Being a good teammate is truly caring about the other people on your team and their success and failures. It's about the group. And that's really hard to fake, especially when you're around people as often as these players are around each other. Paul Dick from Facebook said, Santa would like to speak to Dalton Pompey's future with the Jays. He says, I'll put you on the nice list. <laughs> well, thank you, Santa. I always knew I'd make it back onto the nice list, but uh, here's, here's the answer to your question, in, in my opinion. Yeah, Dalton's a great kid, and he's easy to root for, for a lot of reasons, especially if you're a Jays fan. He's a very talented athlete who just needs a little guidance at the plate, in my opinion. With his speed, the simplest approach is going to serve him best. If I were him, I'd be looking fastball and adjusting off speed 90% of the time. 
stay on the heater, take care of the heater, the rest will, will figure itself out. And teams, they should be afraid to walk Dalton Pompey because of his speed and his ability to steal bases. So that being said, he'll probably see a lot more fastballs than his slower teammates. The key to his success is going to lie in his on-base percentage. Until he really learns how to hit, he's got to be focused on finding ways to get on base. And that means being patient. Look for what you're looking for. When you get it, don't miss it. If you don't get it, let it pass. Work those walks. Get on base. Now, unfortunately, and fortunately for Dalton, he's a switch hitter. That's a, a blessing and a curse. You have to maintain two swings. It's twice as much work, and it can be a real pain in the butt. His instincts and speed in the outfield should serve him well. He needs to play, so I think he ends up in AAA in Buffalo to start the season. Unless, of course, one of the guys that's slated for everyday action in the outfield ends up getting hurt in spring training. We all know injuries are part of baseball, so who knows. But if everybody's healthy that they brought in this offseason, I think Dalton starts the year in AAA, get him some at-bats, and then he'll he'll be a nice addition later on in the season when they can find some playing time for him because he he's a really exciting young talent. We had a couple of questions from uh, Instagram. Now we answered the one about Stroman's shoulder off the top um, from from Emisivum. Uh, our next one comes from Cross Wayne One Sixty Five. What are Tulo and Travis's future with the Blue Jays, and will the Blue Jays be better this year or not? Well, everybody wants to know about Tulo and Devin Travis. Well, health is key for both of these guys. Tulo has not been healthy long enough to be real productive like he was in the past as a member of the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm still a believer. I, I think Tulo's going to break out. It's only a matter of time. He's only 33, after all. It's not like he's you know, a decrepit old man. This guy still has to have some pop in his bat and some spring in his step. I think if he's healthy, he could do some serious damage. Travis hasn't been healthy long enough as a big leader for me to really know what he's capable of. I don't know because I've never seen him healthy over a 162-game stretch. He's only appeared in 213 games over three seasons. Now, he does boast a 290 career average, um, and I can tell you, he has some serious, serious upside. But the biggest test for a major league player is adjusting to the adjustments that the league makes to you. He's never been in the lineup long enough for the league to really adjust to him because he always seems to be coming back from an injury. He'll get off to a really good start. He'll rake. He'll throw some homers out there. I mean, who could believe that double stretch he was on? Uh, but he hasn't been able to stay in the lineup. The, now, Tulo and Travis, those guys are huge keys, along with the health of the starting rotation for the Toronto Blue Jays. They've already had their first setback with Stroman's uh, shutdown with, with shoulder soreness. Uh, so these guys are going to have to produce, and somebody's going to have to step up uh, to fill that spot voided by Stroman until he's ready to come back. Now, I don't know about you guys, um, but I, I'd love to see big things from these, these two players, and I'd love to see health in that starting rotation. Uh, they're going to need it. The, the rest of the league has really made some serious upgrades, and it's going to be tough to compete. Nobody's saying these guys can't do it but it's gotten really, really tough in the American League. And that brings us to the end of our question segment. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but this show just flew by. Um, I had a blast, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all uh, next week. I'm looking forward to seeing all of our new subscribers. Tell your friends and family about Manless TV, and let's make this show bigger and better. Uh, I'm, I'm game, and you know what? Until next week, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you soon.